It's special guest time on the podcast, which is all about the world of marketing on television through TV, shopping, networks, and infomercials. Are we on the air? I'm your host, Sean Wilsey, and for over 29 years, I've hosted shows on cable shopping networks, generating hundreds of millions of dollars in sales. And now I want to be your guide into this world, explaining how it works, why it works, what doesn't work, and introduce you to the people who are making it the success that it is today. Philadelphia-born Joseph Siegel was a budding entrepreneur as early as his teen years, and after starting his first business at the age of 13 by 16, he was already in the prestigious Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and by the time he was 33, he started his 11th company, the extremely successful Franklin Mint, which has stood for generations now as a leading provider of collectibles to the entire world. But it was in 1986 when Joe started his business that probably stands as his most successful and well-known QVC. Sadly, we lost Mr. Siegel in 2019, but the apple not falling far from the tree. His son Marvin carries on the Siegel name in the world of DRTV, now as the innovator of the medium in the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Marvin Siegel to our show today. Marv, it is seriously such an honor to have you here. It is a pleasure to be here. We have a, uh, a great DNA in TV shopping, you and I, and uh, there's a lot of things that people don't know that I'm happy to share with you. <laughs> Let's let this is not going to be a national inquirer sort of thing. I don't want to give know. anybody the wrong idea, but no, that is no. true. You know, seriously, you and I we could God, we could write the ultimate tell all book, couldn't we, between the two of us? I actually I actually wrote a a a a concept for a show called, you know, shop S H O P dot yes. dot dot there's no drugs, there's no sex, there's no violence. And then in parentheses underneath of it, it was, but that's on air. <laughs> and it was basically the whole concept of what happens behind the scenes. <laughs> and I actually had a company, Banyan Productions, that actually had hired a writer to start to play this thing out. It just, everybody started going in different directions. So it's funny you say that. Oh my gosh, that would be fantastic. But no, Marv, and we're going to get later on talking more about what, what Marv has been up to. Is it okay if I call you Marv? Please. Okay. Um, because I've known Marv a lot of years, and so I, I feel a little more fam familiarity. But uh, And we're going to get more along to what Marvin is, is doing right now, because he really is continuing the tradition that his father started. But before we even get into that, because I believe, I, I've heard your father quoted so many times as just a, you know, an entrepreneurial, entre eh, I cannot speak, uh, a, a consummate entrepreneur, and he was constantly inventing businesses. And I, I have to think that had to have started somewhere in his childhood. I mean, what was his upbringing like in Philadelphia? His, uh, his father, my grandfather, was in the real estate business. Uh, and I think it, you're either born with it or you're not. I'll make the comparison to my wife. My wife likes getting a steady paycheck, um, likes the security. You know, and some people want to do something a little bit different. They try to kind of break outside that box a little bit. Uh, I've always been the one to do that. Uh, even, you know, the couple of times we've crossed paths, even when I worked for a company in TV shopping, I was always doing the things that did not fit the norm. Business development to me is like allows you to go all over the place. You don't have to do the same thing over and over again. And uh, I did that at uh, Shop NBC, which became, had a bunch of different names and at QVC, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, but you know, I did vendor relations there at a time when vendors were leaving QVC. People forget that. And Darlene Daggett actually appointed me to basically find out why they were leaving. And uh, that's, and I was never employed. I want to emphasize that I was never, ever an employee of QVC, but I was hired as a consultant with a woman by the name of Marilyn Montrose to try to fix the, uh, the mass exodus of vendors. When you look back at getting back to your, your your father's life and his youth, because by what age thirteen or something he'd already started a company, so he obviously he had that spirit that 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 know how and that uh, demand that he had to do his own thing. That's so unusual for a teenager. It it, it is unusual, and it was again I, the, the point I was getting to. I think it's in your DNA. Yeah, it's what it's what you you see. It's how you're brought up. My daughter is you know running her own business in crisis marketing in South Jersey, 
you eat, it's in you, you know, it's a, you're not somebody who just wants to have a job. And that was in how he was brought up from his father, my grandfather. And uh, he just kept doing that. I mean, go back in time. Think about, I, I get a headache thinking about this. Imagine trying to get approval to mint coins in this country for foreign governments. Right. That's what right. the Franklin Mint did. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, just think of the regulations involved. But, you know, he did that. Think of QVC. Think of trying to basically broadcast a channel back then, uh, you know, up to a transponder, to, to own a satellite transponder position and to be able to do that. I can tell you the family was carrying this transponder position for almost a year before QVC even had a name. So you, you mentioned Franklin Mint, and that's the first big story I want to talk about, because I as a coin collector myself, I'm, I'm very well aware of the Franklin Mint. And in fact, I remember my mother and my grandmother, for that matter, getting Franklin Mint catalogs in the mail. And he was really a pioneer in that, because when we think of direct response today, we think of television, computers, Internet. But he was doing it through mail order and the like with Franklin Mint. How did Franklin Mint come to be? Because it's, like you said, it's a company that wound up, and, and again, some of the things the Franklin Mint was doing in the 1960s, the U.S. Mint wound up doing many years later, like colorized coins and things like that. The way I understand it, it's almost like folklore at this point, um, was my father got remarried. He went to Vegas for his honeymoon. And it was at the time, think of the, the time of, you know, he said the 60s. It was about at that time when the government was calling back in the silver dollars because of the silver content. You're a coin collector. You understand yep. that. And um, what did that cause a problem? The casinos had nothing to put in the slot machines. My father was in the advertising specialty business. Wait, good. My father was in the advertising specialty business making the stupid pens with your name on it, okay? Yes. And uh, and basically, if you go back to what the Franklin was, it was basically, it started as, I'm going to make something you can put in the slot machine that has your name on it. Yeah. That was it. And that was how it started. I mean, it was rather innocent. It was really, I'll call it an extension of the advertising specialty business at the time. It was in 13 different locations around Yaden, PA, um it's main headquarters and there's another whole story there it was on a farm across from wawa dairies you have to be a local northeastern person to know what wawa is um it's a dairy farm and they now have like 7-elevens around this area um but that's where the franklin was and that's that's how it started sean kind of interesting uh, now, you weren't connected with QVC. You mentioned a moment ago until after your, your dad was no longer there, but you had a connection with Franklin Mint, apparently. I There was a period of time that I worked in the art department. Okay. I was a photographer. I have a background in photography. And um, I took pictures very boring. I mean, it's like, you know, when you're the founder's son, you don't really – I actually, there was a chapter in my book that I wrote a zillion years ago and the chapter was entitled, Being the Founder's Son Does Not Mean a Special Place to Park. Right. Words, I got nothing special. There was no nepotism um, there. I, I, I literally took the catalog pictures of the coins all day. Talk about friggin' boring. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I, and during the winter, I lived in northeast Philadelphia, and I drove out to the Franklin Mint. So during the winter, I drove there in darkness. I was in a dark room all day. And I left to come home in darkness. I never saw daylight during all the winter months. Oh, no. Um, and, oh. Yeah, and took, and took pictures of coins up until, and there's a quick little story here. Yes, please. Up until at one point, somebody, the, the head of the art department said, you know what? You're doing a good job. I'm going to put you out on an assignment to take pictures of who was then the president, Chuck Andes, um, at a, he was doing some event. So I follow him. I take the pictures. And coming back that day, it was a beautiful fall day. Anybody knew the Franklin Mint, they would fly the flags for all the coins. I mean, all the countries they were minting coins for. And it was the clouds are really puffy. The, the flags are blowing straight out because there's a nice fall wind blowing across. I laid down in the grass and I shot up through some hedges 
um, this picture. Well, this picture made the cover of the annual report that year. Now, all I heard, Sean, when that happened yes. was, oh, you got that because you're the founder's son. Oh, yeah. And I swore to myself, I'd never let that happen to me again. Yep. And as a point of reference, I did not go to QVC till after my father retired. I was never going to let that happen again. Yeah. Um, and I think in this whole industry, there's, yeah, there's many, no matter what industry you're in, there's always that fear that you're going to be known as, yeah, daddy's boy, you're getting special treatment, special right. privilege. So that that's very admirable, actually, because your dad, he was one who didn't just stop him. And Franklin Mint, very successful. He wound up selling that, what, in the 1970s at some point? Yeah, the guys that own, um, I think, Teleflora bought it. Um, and uh, and then it was, it was sold, bought and sold a few times after he got out of it. And so here you would think, okay, I've done very well. I've done, you know, made a good living. He could have retired. I, I think I read that is they they bought, didn't they buy, they bought something in Italy, a hotel or something. No, Switzerland. Switzerland, thank you. My father loved Switzerland, vacationed there many times, and there was a little bed and breakfast up on a mountain, Mount yeah. Pelerone. And and if I, I'm not making light of the amount of money, but I mean, I, I, I think we'd agree it's not a lot. Right. He bought this little bed and breakfast for about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And uh, but again, my father can never leave anything alone. <laughs> and he had to make it bigger. He had to improve its conference facilities. I believe he brought in, I want to say it was Harvard uh, or one wow. of the major business schools to do their interna international business school there. And they let them design the facilities and he built them to spec for him and then sold it a number of years later, made some money. Um, it was sold to a Japanese group. The Japanese group ended up going bankrupt when the, when the Japanese economy crashed, not with the hotel, right. but the, over there. It went for sale again. The attorney called up my father and said, you know, Joe, you can buy this hotel back. He goes, I don't want it. He goes, well, just make a ridiculous offer just so I can get an offer and tell them that. And he makes this ridiculous offer and it gets accepted. Oh my and he gosh. owns it a second time. Um, <laughs> puts some other money into it and then sells it again. Oh uh, and that was his, uh, but you know, it was a great hotel and that's actually where he, he was the creator also of a international skincare contest. They had a spa there uh, called Le Mirador, which is the name of the hotel. And they create, they were the, really the creator of the first day night cream combination. No kidding. That came out of that, yeah. They came out of that hotel and it was launched on QVC uh, when it first came out. Since you mentioned QVC, I mean, we, we need to fast forward there because, you know, obviously we, this is what Joe, is it safe for me to say? Because, I mean, to me, Franklin Mint, that's huge. But QVC, biggest thing he's known for? I would say certainly it was the biggest thing and certainly because of the medium it's in. But he did a lot of things. I mean, you can roll that as credits or have it as a link in whatever you're doing with the podcast. I mean, he, he really created a lot of businesses. I mean, some of them really kind of goofy. I'm going to go back here for a second. Yes, I please. I mean, he did these like little books, these little comedy books. Oh my gosh, I, we've I all mean, seen those. I'll post an image on, on my YouTube of this. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I mean, he did stuff like that. I mean, I still have that stuff back here. I mean, he did just unbelievable things. Um I mean, in some ways, I'm, my daughter's doing it, and I'm doing it in some ways, and we'll get into what I'm doing now. But, I mean, th there's just a lot there that he always tried to do something different. The, the joke was when he got a Lifetime Achievement Award from uh, Joan Rivers at the Electronic Retailing Association. That, uh, and that link is out there, by the way, if you also want to tag it uh, when you do this thing. Sure. Um, that when... When he got that, it, he was introduced as somebody who professionally retires for a living. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yes, he does. That's very, very good. Right. Um, and again, biggest success story, I, I think we would agree for the moment anyways, is is QVC. But yes. it, he did not, where, whereas Franklin Mint, he invented a lot of the concepts, a lot of the ideas. QVC was a time where he took an idea that was already there, um, 
1977 on radio, Home Shopping Club started, did their local thing, went national in the mid-80s. Um, so what did Joe see? Did he see some, did he watch some Home Shopping Club and see it? Take me back to the, to the eighties. So I know that you just recently did an interview with Bob Sircosta. Yes. And, uh, most people don't know that, uh, a, a bunch of my father's friends from the Franklin Mint started watching, oh. observing, I should say TV shopping back then and TV shopping back then was very hokey. <laughs> um, it, it was it was borderline dishonest. They didn't disclose shipping and handling things that are now standard in today's world. Uh, my father made sure QVC did, and he flew down to Florida and met with Paxson, the founder of, of the Home Shopping Network, and Bob Sircosta, and asked a fundamental question. And that question was, if you could do it over again, what would you do differently? And that is actually what created. Um, QVC before it even had a name. And it was uh, interesting that at my father's memorial, um, I tried to greet everybody as they came in and Mike George, who I respect, came in and uh, Bob Sircosti was already there. He flew up, which I was honored that he flew up for my father's memorial. And when when Mike George came in, I pointed to Bob Sircosti and said, of course, you know who that is. And he went, no, I don't know who that is. Wow. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah. Exactly. That was like, wow. Um, that I said, well, you wouldn't have a job. And he kind of looked at me if it wasn't for Bob Sircosti. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, my father met with him before QVC had a name. And that's what's a shame right now is that people don't realize what, um, what DNA is in QVC and why it does what it does. Yep. I and mean, I reached out through LinkedIn to the, the CEO that's coming in next month that they just uh, hired, Mike George is retiring. And I offered to sit down with him either in New York or down there at QVC and go over the things that made QVC what it is. I mean, cause I was at the family dinners. I know, I know what happened. I, it's that detail yep. that my father is about that's instilled in me and instilled in my daughter that make us what we are, you know, making sure you do it right. You, you don't accept compromise. When you watch QVC today. Do you st- do you feel your dad's presence in it, or is it quite a bit removed from 1986? Um, I think uh, some yes, some no. A- an example of that is when my father put together the QVC board. Um, they had two game show developers on the board of directors. I was going to ask you about that because that seems random. No, no, it was it was done specifically because think before the term gamification existed, my father was doing it. My father realized that he had to have a reason for the viewer to stay engaged and watch this constant selling a product, right, or presenting a product. And uh, my father even went on air a couple of times, which he, I mean, it was just hysterical. I'm going to talk to you about that. Yes, yes. Um, but the. It, they had the word game, the lucky number game. They had all this stuff. And unfortunately, the planners over time after my father retired said, oh, that's a waste of air time. They didn't understand the reason that it was wow. there. Yeah. I remember vividly because I used to get a kick out of watching. Because for those that, that don't know what we're talking about, when we say the word game. Every once in a while, a random customer would be on air talking to the host. And then a, I don't know, it was a sound effect or something. And the, the host would say, you get to play the word game. And a scrambled word would come up. And, and let's be honest, Marv, these words were pretty simple most of the time. It was like... Oh, God, the, first, the first one, the first night, was cat. <laughs> scrambled. Of course. I mean, Stevie Wonder could have figured that <laughs> yeah, out. You know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, um, and, and, and while, while I'm on that really quick, so the first item is, uh, I think legendary, it was that shower radio. And uh, I think it was 2495. Of course, the person, uh, figured out, was able to figure out the scrambled word of cat and, um, they spun the wheel and the person won a hundred dollars. And what was a classic <laughs> moment, my father turned to me, I was standing next to him and my father says, oh, we're $75 upside down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And of course the rest of history. You know, they did 112 million the first year in business. You know, let's go back to that first night, November 24th, 1986, because for anybody under the age of 30, you know, it, it was a 
if you had cable, and in Minneapolis at that time, we didn't have cable. Um, if you had it, you had maybe 30 stations if you were lucky. What was it like to get cable systems to carry QVC back in those early days? Well, uh, there's a book, and I'm looking up here for a second. Hang on one second. Yep. The book is um, The Incredible Dream. It's the life story of Ralph Roberts, the founder of Comcast Cable. Okay. And they were from Philadelphia. So was my father. And my father, there was, and you, you mentioned HSN. So there's a fundamental difference, with, which a lot of people did not realize in the early days, that because of it coming out of radio, which is HSN, that then Paxson said, oh, this is working here. What would it be like on TV? And bought time on over the air TV. My father's model was he went to Ralph Roberts at Comcast Cable, which was a tiny little company at the time, and had this idea. And the best quote ever, which is in Ralph Roberts' book, you know, which I just gave you the title of. Um, and Ralph Roberts said to my father, and it's a whole chapter, by the way, dedicated to my father in that book. And Ralph Roberts said, that's the, that's the stupidest name I ever heard. Wow. You know, QVC, Quality Value Convenience. Uh, but it set the model which was the difference between QVC and HSN, which QVC was all based on cable operators carrying the signal and based on how long they carried it, how low it was in the system, they got a percentage of the sales in their footprint. Right. Um, in fact, going back to the, the foundation of QVC and what made it so different, because for anybody that has not seen, and, and the clips are on YouTube, you can see them, home shopping, honking horns, flashing lights, QVC, much more subdued. Your, your dad actually started this with some, I don't want to say some rules and regulations, but he had some very serious thoughts as to what TV shopping should be. Talk to me about that. He had this three-point guarantee, these things that he said, this is the way it's supposed to be. And in particular, he felt the show host should be the expert for everything. Right. There were no guests. That's and true. That's when, right. A lot of people don't know that. In the early days, it was a host, and that was it. And, and there's a famous person who I'm still friends with today, Joy Mangano, yep. which a movie was made about. And there's a scene in that movie where the Miracle Mop went on air with a male show host. I'm not being sexist right now, but I'm thinking most men are not really good at mopping. Yeah. I'm thinking most people, in general, are not really good at mopping. But anyhow, you had a male show host trying to mop a linoleum floor, and he did not do well. And the product bombed. Joy had mortgaged and sold her soul mm. to make the mop and begged. There's rumors as to who she begged. I mean, whether it was my father, whether it was some other executive to go back on air with the product. She did that and it sold out. From that point forward, they allowed guests to go on air. I was always under the impression that one of the first big guests was Joan Rivers. Maybe she was one of the first big celebrity guests at QVC. No, first celebrity guest that he had to beg because there were no celebrities up until her major at that point. And um, Joan, God bless her, was always a friend of the family. Whenever I would see Joan, and you know I was on air for a long time at QVC with a product, whenever I would see Joan in the hallway, Joan would always yell out across the hallway, Marvin, how you doing? How's your dad? How's your mom? Mm. An absolute sweetheart. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the persona of what she was is not what she was just as a person. Right. She was amazing. Yeah. Well, I think we have a long ways to go in this conversation, Marvin. So we're going to pick it up next time as we continue here. I especially am very interested to get into the the, the future of this industry. Where is the future? Because Marv is working on some things right now that very likely could be the future of the industry. You can learn a whole lot more about Marvin Siegel by going to his website, marvinsegel.com. Let me spell that for you. M-A-R-V-I-N-S-E-G-E-L.com. And there's a couple spellings of that surname there. And I hope you'll check me out on Twitter at Sean Wilsey. Speaking of spelling, S-H-A-W-N-W-I-L-S-I-E. There's a ton of ways of spelling that, too. And on Instagram at S Wilsey. Hey, thank you so much. I mean that seriously for downloading this edition of Are We On The Air. I hope you'll leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and various places. This has been a King Bobby production.
Yes, I know, Travis. That's why we give such bargains. 